Well, this is the ninth in a series of messages called uh, Healthy Homes, Healthy Relationships. We talked about healthy moms, healthy dads, healthy singles, healthy dating, healthy marriage. Uh, last week we talked about healthy relationships in our body politic, and today we come to healthy romance. Uh, down through the years, uh, men and women have had all kinds of ways to express their love for each other, write a letter, uh, write a song, uh, give a gift, but the most popular of all has been to write poetry. Uh, Browning wrote, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Poe wrote, this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child and I was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee. Of all the love poems written down through history, it may surprise you to learn that possibly the best is found in the Bible. It's called the Song of Songs. At first glance, it looks out of place in church. It causes us to blush. Uh, but the fact that God included this in his word is a reminder that he made us male and female. Romance was his idea. It's a good thing. So whether you're married, a teenager, single, single again, widowed, it's important that you know what the Bible teaches about romance. What we see today in movies and television and pornography is so distorted from God's plan that we need to understand what God has to say. Uh, what he teaches could be for you personally or it could be for you just to be aware to talk about with the other people in your sphere of influence. I think you would benefit from looking at the Bible today, so if you want to use one of our Bibles under the seats in front of you, it's going to be on page 672, Song of Songs. First verse says, Solomon's Song of Songs. It was written by Solomon, and it was his song of all songs. In 1 Kings 4.32, we read Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. This was his best. You say, I understand Solomon had many wives. That's true. He had 700 wives. He also acquired 300 concubines. You say, why should I be interested in getting counsel from a man like that? Well, good question. First, we need to remember that it was a culture of polygamy. So I don't think we should pass judgment on another culture in another time. In this poem, we find that out of all his women, he had one that was his true love. So we get in this poetry a, a picture of monogamy within a polygamous culture. Most importantly, Jesus said about the Old Testament, not a dot or a cross of a T will pass away from God's word until all things come to pass. Jesus says this is in God's word and it's all true. So when someone can predict their death and resurrection and then pull it off, Christians just believe everything they say. And so because of Jesus, we believe uh, this poem that I'm going to read with you today. The bride begins, chapter 1, verse 2, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let it, the king bring me into his chambers. You know, we read these first verses and say, boy, we are in for some good stuff. <laughs> these two were expressive of their love. Solomon, the groom, responds to his bride, verse 9, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots, Pharaoh's chariot horses. This was a common battle tactic. You let out a female horse in front of the, the chariots and all the male horses then can't concentrate and they can't pull the chariots. Solomon is saying, you are so beautiful, you distract me, I can't focus on anything else. Verse 15, how beautiful you are, my darling. 
Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. Why would God include this poem in his word? I believe it is to show us that romance is part of his plan for us. I think it is to show us that the foundation for love is to make love a verb. The foundation for love is to make love a verb. Love is more than a feeling. It is an action. It's something we do. When we do not make love a verb, romance eludes us. From this love poem, we learn that love will decay when four elements for making love a verb are lacking. The first element lacking when love decays is lack of attention. Why is it that an attractive woman with an intelligent, successful husband leaves him for somebody else who isn't half as good looking? He pays attention to her. She craves it. Let's face it, we all do. Look at the kind of loving attention Solomon and his bride paid to each other. We'll start in chapter 2, verse 14. This is the, the bride. My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. All night long, on my bed, chapter 3, I looked for the one my heart loves, I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one whom my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I brought him to my mother's house to the room of the one who conceived me. This man is adored and pursued. At the end of chapter three, the wedding is held. Then in chapter four, the king extols his wife on their wedding night. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. One fellow tried this and he said, it just didn't work with my wife. <laughs> well, of course not. This is written in another culture, an agrarian culture, using metaphors and similes that fit. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from washing. Don't try this, it won't work. Each has its twin, not one of them is missing. He's saying she has gorgeous teeth, she has a beautiful smile. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. This is verse 5, chapter 4. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. You say, well, I sure missed that in Sunday school. <laughs> well, you got to come every week. <clears throat> you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. This guy is creative, expressive, and attentive with his love. She responds to him in verse 10 of chapter 5. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with topaz. His body is like polished ivory decorated with lapis lazuli. That's a gem. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, daughters of Jerusalem. These two make love a verb. They're attentive to each other. They notice each other. For romance to flourish, couples have to compliment each other, thank each other, 
and be aware of each other's needs. The most common cause of an affair is neglect. The husband may provide well for the family, but neglect his wife's needs to feel cherished. The wife may do well with the children, but doesn't meet her husband's sexual needs or join him on recreational pursuits. When deep human needs are left unmet, the door to infidelity swings wide open. We as humans are needy people. Our spouse is the primary one to meet our needs. When we don't receive it from our spouse, we're tempted to look elsewhere. Now, I'm not suggesting any affair is justified. It's always wrong. But when you don't meet your uh, mate's needs, you're not attentive to your mate, you make the temptation greater. To make love a verb, we treat our mate as if they are more important than we are. Have you ever met someone more important than you? You treat them with honor and respect. The Apostle Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. You say, you go first. And your mate says, no, you go first. When a couple gets this going on, it's powerful. They treat each other as if they're more important than themselves. You know what I know about you? Whether or not you are a follower of Christ, I don't know what you think about the Bible or the whole God thing, but I know that deep inside of you, you're thinking, that would be awesome. All of us would love to have a mate that's attentive to us. The second thing lacking when love decays is lack of leisure. Chapter 7, verse 11. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Wow. I read between the lines that these two took time for each other. We don't usually have time, do we, to go out in the country and look at the blooms? Creative love like that took planning and time. Most of us live at a high pace. We're always in a hurry. Do you know one thing that suffers when we always live life at breakneck speed? I'm willing to bet a huge amount of someone else's money that one thing that will suffer is romance. There's a fascinating verse in Deuteronomy. Moses writes, If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year he is free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Wow! A one-year honeymoon. The interesting thing about this verse is that it's a command. More commandments, please. We need leisure time with our mate. Jory and I have always made a practice of going away, away one week a year without our kids. We've had parents, grandparents that have been so good to take care of our kids. Now that our kids have gotten, some of them have gotten older, they take care of our younger kids. We try to schedule a couple weekends away alone. We always go on a date one night a week. And we try to spend at least an hour together each night. These are just basic minimums to making love a verb. The third thing lacking when love decays is a lack of responsiveness. Chapter 5, verse 2. I slept, but my heart was awake. This is the bride talking. She's sleeping, but she's dreaming. Listen, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair, it's raining or something. My hair with the dampness of the night. I've taken off my robe, she responds. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. 
I arose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchman <clears throat> found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me, they bruised me, they took away my cloak. Those watchmen of the walls, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my beloved, what will you tell them? Tell him I am faint with love. Her initial reaction is to deny his request. Finally, she reconsiders and unlocks the door. But by the, by the time she has done so, he has left. So husbands, this now becomes our favorite passage in the Bible. You read this together with your wife every night before you crawl in bed. And it really cuts both ways. If your wife ever initiates romantically, don't say, oh honey, I'm so tired, I gotta get up early in the morning. God says, don't be an idiot. The clear implication is that husbands and wives are to be responsive to each other. Not only sexually, but to all requests. Learn to say yes to each other as often as possible. J. Allen Peterson in his book, The Myth of the Greener Grass, says that adultery is caused by a myth. It's the myth of the greener grass. When you're not getting along with your mate, you're struggling together, other people tend to look more attractive. He says, make your lawn so green that all other lawns will look brown by comparison. You be so sensitive, so kind, so caring, so responsive sexually, so attentive, that your mate wouldn't think of looking elsewhere. Some of us make a patch of weeds look good. Our lawn is so brown. The fourth thing that is lacking that causes love to decay is a lack of security. Chapter 7, verse 10. She says, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. She's secure in his love. She, she knows that she's the one and only one. That's why I say I find monogamy in the midst of this polygamous culture. Chapter 8, verse 6, he says, Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. What love is as strong as death? Love that is secure. You're secure that your mate is faithful. You're secure that you're first in your mate's affections. You're secure that your partner is committed to the marriage for a lifetime. Nothing can destroy marriage faster than a lack of security, a lack of faithfulness. One guy writes in to Dear Abby, I've been living with two girls for the past two years. I've been married to neither one and neither one knew about the other. After a long time, they found out about each other. And the two girls got together and dumped me. Now I'm discouraged and depressed. Don't give me this morality stuff, but how can you help me? Abby writes back, Dear discouraged, morality is what makes human beings human beings. If you don't want any of that stuff, all I can say is see your veterinarian. <laughs> Husbands and wives need to know that they are secure. Com commitment between two partners is one of the strongest magnets that holds a marriage and romance together. Our culture has such a low pain threshold. Things just get a little uncomfortable and a person says, I'm out of here. Our culture tells us, you know, if, if you're not happy in your marriage, get out of it and start over with somebody new. Gone are the days when someone says, I do, and they can be counted on to keep that commitment for a lifetime. 
But if you want romance, redeclare your loyalty and your permanent commitment to your mate. Let's say you're eating a snack, a little snack late at night and uh, not even all that late. You, the kids have just gone upstairs to get ready for bed and all of a sudden a drop hits the table and then another one and then another one and you look up and there's water forming on the ceiling and dripping. What do you do? Do you get a towel and a bucket? No, you don't deal with the symptoms, you deal with the source. You race upstairs, you find that the faucet's running in the tub, the kids have the tub plugged, and it's pouring out onto the bathroom floor. You turn off the faucet, you pull the plug, and you lecture your kids. You deal with the source of the problem. One of the sources of a decaying romance is a lack of of security, a lack of faithfulness. Solomon writes in Proverbs 5, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be cap captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? God says romance is to be reserved for your mate. He says that sexual immorality is stupid and sexual purity is smart. He asks, why look for something elsewhere when you can find it in your own home? The, fountain, the foundation for romance is to make love a verb. You love your partner. You pay attention to them. You make time for them. You say yes to them as often as possible. And you're faithful. You say, I'd like to increase romance in my marriage. Make love a verb in my life, but I don't think I can. I'm not sure I know how. Well, you're probably right. You can never make love a verb on your own. But Christ can help you. Jesus says in one of his most famous lines, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You have to depend on Christ, on Christ's power through the Holy Spirit. Prophet Malachi has some fascinating things to say about marriage. Chapter 2. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It's because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard. Do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. God's displeased with the people because they're not making love a verb. Instead, they're being unfaithful to their partners. The remedy he says it three times. Be on your guard. What causes an affair? It always starts in your spirit. You allow an attitude of irritation toward your mate to build up. Something you don't like that they're doing and it builds within you and it grows to lack of respect or even disgust. He says, be on your guard. Guard your spirit. 
You guard against let it, letting a bad attitude develop toward your spouse. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 3, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Correct answer is by believing what you heard. Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? If you're a Christian, you know that you are saved not by human effort, but by faith in Christ, by the Spirit of God, right? How foolish then to think that though we become a Christian by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can finish the work of being a Christian on our own power. Paul says it can't be done. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit's power. Do you know that power is the same power which God used when he raised Christ from the dead? That lives in you? We have to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us make love a verb. Thank you, God, for including this book in the Bible. At first glance, it seems so out of place. Thought this was a spiritual book, but we learned that you care about our lives, all the details of our lives, including romance. You want it for us. You created it. I want to give you a moment to pray. Why don't you tell God, maybe you were convicted at something in, uh, during this. Something you needed, maybe you're married. Uh, an area you're not attending to? Why don't you confess that? Tell God you, you need his help. Maybe you're single. You're not exercising self-control. Would you tell God what you heard today and what you want to do in response? And all of us, tell him you need to depend on him. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You pray. Thank you, God, that you care about all parts of our lives. You want to be involved and help us know how to do it. In Jesus' name we pray.